before I move on to uh, more detail about 12 DCD interpretation, I want to do a quick recap of the basic uh, complexes and intervals on an ECG. And uh, what's important to sort of keep in mind when you're thinking about 12 lead ECGs is the difference between interpreting rhythms on the monitor and interpreting 12 lead ECGs is with uh, an ECG monitor, we're looking at everything, let me draw it over here, we're looking at everything on the horizontal plane. So we're looking at PR intervals, heart rates, QRS durations, QT intervals, etc. On a 12 lead ECG, we're looking at everything on the vertical plane. So we're looking at voltage changes um, in terms of ST segment elevation, ST segment depression, size of the QRS, which may be an indication of hypertrophy. Everything is voltage related. Everything is on the vertical um, axis. So let's first look at a quick review of complexes before we get into the next uh, few slide presentations. So. Um, You'll recall that a normal P interval is between 0.12 and 0 0.20 seconds. So that's um, three small squares to five small squares. A normal QRS, QRS is less than 0.12 second. Now, some people have been taught that a normal QRS is 0.12 second or less. That's not correct. A uh, normal QRS is less than 0.12 second or less than three small squares. If it's 0.12 second or greater, it's considered wide. The question is, why is it wide? Is it aberrant conduction because of a, a bundle branch block or a fascicular block or a bifascicular block? Or is it a drug effect? Uh, it, is it because it's an ectopic bead in the ventricles? That, that's the question. But a normal QRS duration is less than 0.12 second. Next comes the ST segment, and this is critically important when we're looking at um, ST segment elevation MI or STEMI, which I'm going to focus this presentation on, not the specific slide presentation, but the overall um, presentation of this material on. So the ST segment begins at the end of the QRS here, and this is also referred to as a J point, and the ST segment ends at the beginning of the T wave. And so in an acute myocardial infarct, for example, we're looking at ST elevation above the baseline. And uh, oopsie, a bit of a mistake there. But lastly, in terms of intervals, um, so there's the J point there that I mentioned, and we look for elevation of the J point in acute MI. And lastly, we look at the QT interval. Now, um, I have to say most paramedics that I know and, and most eMERGE staff don't routinely look at the QT interval. I've gotten into the habit of it because if a patient has prolonged uh, a prolonged QT, they're at risk of uh, torsade de point, which, as you know, is a lethal dysrhythmia. And uh, so whenever I interpret ECGs, I very quickly eyeball the QT interval to see if it appears to be prolonged or not. And if it appears to be prolonged, uh, I'll look at it in a little more detail. So a normal Q interview, QT interval rather should be less than half of the R to R interval. So here's the R to R interval. Um, and um, uh, the halfway point is about here. So you can see that the T wave ends before the halfway mark. So that's a normal Q QT interval. A prolonged QT, on the other hand, is one where the uh, QT interval ends beyond the halfway mark between the two R waves. And this can happen with either a narrow QRS or uh, a Y QRS. Uh, so either or. Whoops. That's terrible. Difficult to draw on this sometimes. Um, and causes of prolonged QT include certain drugs. Some patients are born with prolonged QT, and they call it congenital prolongation of the QT. And um, oftentimes, uh, patients will uh, experience sudden cardiac death with no known past medical history uh, and sometimes only to discover later that if they had a cardiogram done in the past that they had uh, prolongation of the QT that went sort of more or less unnoticed. 